This video is brought to you by Buddhist Studies Online. Click the link below to sign up for courses on the history, philosophy, and languages of Buddhism taught by top university professors. Buddhism is a complex religious and philosophical tradition with over 500 million adherents that spans 2,500 years of history. As Buddhism has developed over its long history, it's marked by constant reinterpretation of central ideas, introduction of new scriptures and practices, and intermingling with local traditions in the places where Buddhism has spread. Because of this internal diversity, early European visitors to Asia actually did not realize that what was practiced in Sri Lanka and what was practiced in China or Japan was was in some sense the same thing, what we call Buddhism. So what is this thing called Buddhism? What are some of the key ideas, questions, or practices that run through this tradition? This is episode one in a multi-part series on Buddhism. In this first episode, we'll examine Buddhism's origins, major themes in the tradition, and the modern forms of Buddhism that we see today. I'm sure there's a question that a lot of you are asking. Is Buddhism even a religion? You can find plenty of people today who will argue that no, Buddhism is not a religion, and that instead it's a philosophy or a way of life. This stretches all the way back to European writers in the 1850s when an Anglican minister, Charles Hardwick, who wrote extensively on Buddhism, tried to argue that it was a philosophy instead of a religion. He wrote, what I intend by Buddhism is the system of metaphysical and social philosophy organized by the Buddha. Neither am I speaking here of Buddhism in its modern development. And by modern development, he basically meant a mixture of folk religion and, in his words, older superstitions. He concluded that we shall be dealing now with a philosophy rather than with a religion. And sure, if you remove rituals and beliefs and sacred writings and institutions like monks and nuns, I guess what's left over is a metaphysical and social philosophy. But what we're seeing here is Hardwick's explicitly Protestant Christian understanding of religion, a definition of religion that focuses strongly on belief in a monotheistic creator god and de-emphasizing ritual. When we run into this question, it's important to remember that religion as a category has been defined in different ways, by different people, and for different purposes. So when someone asks, is Buddhism a religion? One good question to ask back is, how are you defining religion? If your definition of religion follows Charles Hardwick's definition, trying to distill Buddhism down into some essentialized form by removing culturally specific beliefs and practices, I'm sure you can create a version of Buddhism that is not a religion. But it's also important to remember that the very word religion emerges out of a particular Christian-centric historical and social context. There's not actually a word in any Asian language that corresponds directly to the English concept of religion. Another good question to ask is, why do they think it matters whether Buddhism is a religion or not? For many Buddhists today, especially in English language contexts, religion has become kind of a dirty word associated with blind faith and the lack of personal freedom. And so people who think religion is bad may not want to associate Buddhism with religion. For our academic purposes here, we will be treating Buddhism as a religion, and we'll be following Dr. Stephen Prothero's model of religion, which suggests that religions provide an account of a human problem that people face, claim to provide a solution to that problem, advocate various practices and techniques for solving that problem, and offer exemplars of people who have solved the problem. Like all definitions of religion, this one has pros and cons, but it will be helpful today to better understand Buddhism, even if the category itself is imperfect. Now with that abstract theoretical question out of the way, let's turn our attention to Buddhism itself. A good question to start with would be, what makes someone a Buddhist? One traditional answer is that a Buddhist is someone who has gone for refuge to the three jewels. Going for refuge means that someone has gone to Buddhism for protection from the sufferings of the world. And the three jewels are the Buddha, who teaches a path out of suffering, the Dharma, the Buddha's teachings about reality, and the Sangha, the community of Buddhists all seeking a path out of suffering. So let's use this model of the three jewels to structure our intro to Buddhism. Let's start with the Buddha, who is considered to be the founder of Buddhism. Now, we'll examine this much more deeply in episode two of this series, but briefly, Buddha is actually a title meaning awakened one. It's used to refer to a man named Siddhartha Gautama, who lived in the fifth century BCE in what is now around Nepal and northern India. Historians don't know very much about Siddhartha Gautama as a historical figure, but according to Buddhist legend, he was a wealthy prince who abandoned his life of luxury to search for a solution to the problem of suffering, or dukkha. 
the Buddha argued that human life is marked by dukkha, a term that's often translated as suffering but really means something closer to stress, unsatisfactoriness, or even dis-ease. Not disease in the sense of sickness, but just that sense of not being at ease, or not fitting into the world. The Buddha spent many years searching for a solution to this problem of stress and suffering, and eventually claimed to have attained awakening, or enlightenment, also known as nirvana. In other words, the Buddha claimed to attain deep understanding of reality that allowed him to finally blow out or eliminate the problem of suffering. He then spent the rest of his life teaching to a growing group of disciples what he realized. The Buddha is said to have given many teachings in his life, but among the most important ones are contained in his very first sermon, known as the Discourse Which Turns the Wheel of Dharma. This text can be found in the Samyutta Nikaya section of the Pali Canon, which is today believed by Theravada Buddhists to be the oldest record of the Buddha's teachings. These teachings were said to have been memorized by the Buddha's disciples and passed down orally for hundreds of years before being written down in the first century BCE. Now, scholars debate whether this was, in fact, the Buddha's first sermon. Some argue that it was edited in the first few hundred years and was only later identified as the first sermon, but this question is still left open. Dharma here refers to the Buddha's teachings about the nature of reality, and turning the wheel of Dharma indicates teaching the truth about reality. In this sermon, the Buddha outlines the four noble truths. The first truth is suffering. Suffering, according to the Buddha, is just a fact of life. We suffer when we get sick, or when we get old, or when loved ones die. We also suffer mentally because we spend our lives chasing after things that we think will make us happy. We suffer when we don't get them, and even if we do get them, we worry that they'll be taken away or we'll get bored and start to fixate on some other thing. Thus, we're trapped in this endless and stressful cycle of craving and suffering. Meanwhile, this intense fixation on our own wants and needs blinds us to the needs of others causing us still more suffering. The Buddha is not saying that there is no joy and happiness to be found in life. Instead, he's pointing out that moments of happiness are fleeting, but that we often return to a baseline situation of stress and worry. So the first noble truth is a recognition that part of being alive in this world is dealing with suffering, stress, and pain. The second noble truth is that this suffering has an origin. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. There are a couple ways of thinking of the origin of suffering. In the first sermon, the Buddha points to craving as the origin of suffering. In other texts, though, he expands that to recognize other causes. One major cause of suffering is karma. Karma is a Sanskrit term that literally means action. We can understand it as cause and effect. If you do good things, good things will happen to you. And if you do bad things, bad things will happen to you. And so the Buddha says that much of the suffering in our lives results from the consequences of previous actions. So you might ask, why don't we just stop doing bad things if we know they'll result in bad consequences? Well, the Buddha argued that most of the time when humans do bad things, it's because they're being driven by hatred, greed, or delusion. These three reactive emotions are known as the three poisons. And the Buddha argued that they're at the root of human suffering. The third noble truth, then, is that suffering can be ended. And that's because if hatred, greed, and delusion cause bad actions, humans can end the bad actions and ultimately end suffering if those are removed. Moreover, if humans can replace hatred, greed, and delusion with wisdom and compassion, they can attain nirvana, the state of freedom from suffering. Finally, the fourth noble truth is the path from suffering. This path has been described as the middle way between the extremes of self-indulgence and self-mortification. It's also been described as an eightfold path that the Buddha prescribes for overcoming suffering, steps that include training in moral discipline, concentration, and wisdom. We can summarize the Four Noble Truths like this. Life sucks. Here's why. You can fix it. Here's how. Or to use a metaphor that the Buddha himself is said to have used repeatedly in the Pali Canon, the Buddha is like a doctor who observes symptoms, offers a diagnosis, makes a prognosis, and then offers a treatment. Two important ideas emerge from this central teaching. First, all things are impermanent, meaning that everything is changing all the time. This is true for all of the material things we own, but also for ourselves. Even as you sit there watching this video, you are changing. Second, because all things are impermanent, all things are interconnected. Nothing exists permanently and independently. Just as an oak tree depends on sun and water, 
the soil from which it's emerging, the acorn that it grew from, and the squirrel that buried the acorn itself, so do all things depend on one another. The Buddha taught that beings who recognize these truths about reality would be naturally compassionate and would suffer less. These teachings and many others are preserved in the Buddhist canon, the collection of sacred texts. Different Buddhist groups have different versions of what they consider to be the Buddhist canon, but in each case it's many times larger than the Bible or the Quran. For example, the Taisho edition of the Japanese Buddhist canon contains 2,920 texts collected in over 85 volumes. The oldest version of the Canon, known as the Pali Canon, was published in translation by the Pali Text Society in 57 volumes. So yeah, a lot of texts that we couldn't possibly cover in one video. Let's turn now to the third jewel, the Buddhist community or the Sangha. While the Buddha was teaching, he gained many followers. However, not all of these followers undertook the same kind of practices. That is, the Buddha did not present a single set of teachings and practices that are one size fits all. Instead, he taught a general path for beings to follow. This is known as the teaching of the gradual or graduated path. The starting point is ordinary desire and suffering, and the end point is awakening to freedom from suffering, or nirvana. According to the Buddha, the path from the starting point to nirvana takes many, many lifetimes to fully traverse, as we're born again and again in an unsatisfactory cycle called samsara. Some beings may be at one stage in the path, and so should focus on certain kinds of practices. Other beings may be at another point along that path, and so should focus on different sorts of practices. At the beginning of the path are lay people, who form the majority of Buddhists. For them, nirvana is a distant and mostly unachievable goal, and so they generally focus on generating merit and good karma. They do this by cultivating generosity, by making donations to the monks and nuns, by making offerings to images, or generally trying to accumulate merit and good karma in hopes of attaining a good rebirth in the next life. They also might take vows as a way of cultivating purity and moral discipline. For the most part, scholars believe that most lay Buddhists rarely or never studied Buddhist scriptures or meditated themselves. They were way too busy working or taking care of kids to do stuff like that. Instead, they hoped that by accumulating merit, they might be reborn as a monk or a nun in a future life. The next step along the path, as I just alluded to, is becoming a monk or a nun. Monks and nuns shave their heads, wear robes, and give up ordinary family life in order to focus on following the Buddha's path out of suffering. They undertook practices such as memorizing and reciting the Buddhist scriptures, performing rituals aimed at generating good karma, and generally trying to cultivate moral discipline. Even further along the path, advanced monks and nuns might take up the philosophical study of Buddhist texts or meditation practices. As we'll examine in episode 3 of this series, these meditation practices aimed at cultivating mental concentration and deep personal realization of the truth of the Buddha's teachings. This was thought to be able to lead to awakening and escape from the problem of suffering. These days, Buddhism and meditation are often stereotypically conflated, such that people think that Buddhism is all about meditation. And while it might be true that meditation is very important to Buddhism, because it's a key technique for realizing the truth about reality, it has usually been thought of as an advanced technique, rather than one that all Buddhists can or should do. Instead, for most Buddhists throughout time, the focus was on everyday practices such as ritual and generosity. Still, we can say that each stage of the gradual path is focused on gradually transforming the mind in order to prepare for the next stage of the path, and to get a little bit closer to awakening. To continue our exploration of the broader Buddhist community, I want to say a little bit about the different forms of Buddhism that are around today. Each form deserves its own video, but it's worth summarizing them here. As Buddhists throughout history interpreted and reinterpreted the Buddha's teachings, new schools of thought and practice emerged. Today we can think of Buddhists as living in three broad traditions. They share many of the same ideas and practices, but they also differ about what texts they consider to be the best representation of the Buddha's teaching, and also how they understand Buddhahood itself. Each of these forms of Buddhism is also shaped by long interaction with the cultures where they took root. Monks and nuns in each of these places also wear somewhat different robes and follow somewhat different versions of the monastic code. 
First, we have Theravada Buddhism, which is practiced in much of Southeast Asia, including Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. Theravada Buddhists consider themselves to be practicing the form of Buddhism that is closest to what early Buddhist communities would have practiced. They enshrine the Pali Canon, a collection of texts composed in the ancient language of Pali that is believed to go back to the Buddha's lifetime. In these texts, the Buddha is portrayed as a relatively human figure who teaches individuals the long and gradual path out of suffering, which is assumed to take many millions of lifetimes. Next, we have forms of Buddhism as it's practiced in China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. These forms of Buddhism largely follow a school of Buddhism known as the Mahayana, literally the Great Vehicle. This is a school of Buddhist thought that emerged in the early centuries of the Common Era. It introduced new Buddhist scriptures and ideas, including the notion that Siddhartha Gautama was only the emanation of a fundamental principle of awakening that pervades the whole universe. Mahayana Buddhism interacted with religious traditions already present in East Asia and developed forms such as Zen and Pure Land Buddhism, which we'll examine in future episodes. Finally, we have Tibetan Buddhism, which took root in Tibet and is still practiced in Tibet, Mongolia, as well as parts of Nepal and northern India today. Tibetan Buddhists also consider themselves to be part of the Mahayana or Great Vehicle, but their orientation towards Mahayana Buddhism is deeply influenced by a group of texts called Tantras that Tibetan Buddhists consider scripture. These books outline complex philosophical ideas and ritual practices aimed at attaining awakening as quickly as a single lifetime. They are thus considered to be representatives of Vajrayana Buddhism, which literally means the diamond vehicle. The most famous representative of this form of Buddhism is His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is considered to be an emanation of a bodhisattva himself. So to summarize the key themes, the first is that Buddhist traditions are very diverse. Here I focused on some of the earliest and most influential ideas and practices, but the highly localized quality of Buddhism means that it's important to remind ourselves that particular manifestations of Buddhism may be quite different than this general picture. Buddhism has also continually evolved over its 2500 year history, and it continues to change today. No single video can capture the complexity of all 2,500 years. That said, the second point I want to reiterate is that certain questions and concerns do run throughout Buddhist traditions. The first is the continual emphasis on the three jewels. The Buddha, the Dharma, aka the Buddha's teachings, and the Sangha, the Buddhist community. In addition, we see a pervasive concern to recognize and overcome the problem of suffering, a recognition that so much suffering stems from our own ingrained mental habits, and a commitment to cultivation to remove these causes of suffering. Moreover, Buddhism is grounded in a worldview that takes impermanence and interdependence as the fundamental nature of reality. If you'd like to learn more about Buddhism, then I'd really recommend that you check out today's sponsor, Buddhist Studies Online. Buddhist Studies Online is an educational platform that offers online courses on the history, philosophy, and languages of Buddhism. Top university professors teach the courses, and in fact, one of the instructors, a professor at the University of Wyoming named Dr. Kate Hartman, co-wrote the episode that you're watching right now. Just like Religion for Breakfast, Buddhist Studies Online teaches from an academic and non-sectarian perspective. Each course includes video lectures, readings, quizzes, and optional live Q&A sessions with the instructor. Upcoming courses include Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism and Women, Buddhism and Animal Ethics, and Zen Buddhism. Plus, more are being added all the time. They're designed to be accessible, affordable, and meaningful to students of all backgrounds. To learn more or to sign up, click the link in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching.